you're, you're the man over there. Push the button. We got a button push? All right, Burmish, can you hear me now? 100%. Woo! That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Miracle. That's what I'm talking about. First of all, good to talk to you, and uh, uh, we'll get to some topics here in a second, but uh, you are slightly farther north than we are, and we are experiencing a what we would call a cold day here, Mick. A cold snap. Yes, can you, can you tell I'm trying to rub it in? <laughs> no, I know. Can you tell? Gosh, it's, it was 47 degrees last night, Jason, here. Jason yeah. does oh, listen wow. to last night. He's cool thing. <laughs> One of the things he does on his, on his YouTube page is he does something called a walk and talk where he, he logs on to his YouTube page. He's got his selfie stick. Yeah. He takes his dog, uh, his dog's karma. Is that right? That karma? is correct. Yep. And he goes for a walk, and he talks on the YouTube channel, and everyone that's logging in yeah. can talk back to him. Yeah. And, and he literally, well, sometimes, you know, in the springtime and the summertime, I'm watching him walk up there. It's really pretty in upstate New York. I'm watching my boy freeze his ass off. <laughs> <laughs> can't, see, can't even find the ground. I think you took your niece's sledding or something the last time I saw you outdoors. Was that what's going on? Yeah, yeah, and it was even colder today. They had school today. We got like, uh, I don't know, like an inch and a half, two inches last night, maybe a little bit more. Um, so we st- we're probably still going to have a white Christmas. It's upstate New York, man. Uh, I'm kind of used to this by now. We're only in uh, December. This could run all the way through March. I remember... Two years ago, we got snow in April. I think it was like April 2nd. So, I mean, anything's possible in upstate New York. All right, that is Jason <laughs> Burmis. He's on the show every Thursday, most of the time. Anyway, we call it Conspiracy Corner. We've been following stories that the mainstream media won't talk about and will usually tell you something that you should be looking into that isn't being talked about. For instance, some of the things that went down, I've already mentioned during this impeachment, including the Afghan papers, if you will, the big Washington Post expose about all the lies from of the, all people of the military industrial complex and the Pentagon had it been lying year after year. And that includes three presidents now. That's Bush, that's Obama, and Trump. Yep. And this is an 18-year war. It's about $4 billion a, a, a month we pump into there. Oh, it's been over a trillion dollars spent, and none of that is making the news because it's Jason it's, uh, what was it called? Mary Impeachment? Mary Impeachment. Mar- Mary Impeachment. It's not Christmas. It's so, impeachment. Jason, why don't you pick it up from your perspective and, and kind of fill in the blanks a little, and then uh, I'm sure if you got an Epstein update, and uh, I'll bow to you and you take it away. Well, we're talking about Afghanistan, we're talking about Iraq, and we're talking about Libya, and we're talking about Yemen. All of this is just about full-spectrum dominance in the Middle East with our Saudi and Israeli allies. Make no mistake about it. It's why no one's challenged him on the fact that now we have a third OPCW leak by WikiLeaks, yet again giving us more confirmation what? That there was no gas attack in Duma. If you want to talk about Afghanistan specifically, there's a documentary that's uh, probably been out there a little bit over a year. I covered it when I was working with um, Luke Radowski of We Are Change. I believe you can check it out either on Prime Video or one of the streaming services. It's called Combat Obscura Obscura, because it shows the not-so-nice side of a war that really has no mission. And these guys were embedded years ago and knew that there was really no mission. The mission there is to keep the region destabilized, test out our new little biometric toys, dominate the region for its resources, and allow ourselves and our allies to have permanent military uh, bases and a presence in that area. That's the reality. So even when you get these papers, they're somewhat of a whitewash. You know, everybody talks in these proper terms, and nobody's uh, willing to lay it lay it on the line in the language that I'm saying. That's this is a war for dominance and profit, not to keep our freedom safe from the terrorists. Yeah, uh, you mentioned a little bit about uh, uh, just to backtrack on that. It's been about seven years since we've, and this was during Obama. Uh, that we started military action in Syria, everything from bombing runs and eventually uh, fighting three different forms of terrorists, two who the CIA were secretly arming. It's just your typical cluster F of, like you say, when you want to take from countries, you destabilize the country. So they fight, and the best thing to do is get them fighting amongst themselves. It's like the magician, they're distracted, and you can come in. And I know that Trump said something about we had troops around the northern area of Syria where all the oil was. Didn't Trump already say we have the oil or we've captured the oil? I'm trying to remember the exact same line. 
This was only a few weeks ago. Do you remember what that was? Yeah, but what he's really trying to talk about is the Golan Heights region, which is the highly contested region, which he just gave to Israel, which is really serious. You know, Israel, um, you know, took it in, in a, uh, I forget how many, it might have been a 12-day war. I don't want to... I don't want to get that wrong, but they basically gained it. No one has recognized it's Israel's. However, because Genie Energy is involved and cronies both on the right and the left, make no mistake about it, people like Bill Richardson, who are connected to Epstein, are also connected to Genie Energy. He just wants to declare that, that region, so they can overtake that aspect of uh, the oil. And obviously, Assad isn't happy about it. He's not happy about a lot of things, uh, but most Americans wouldn't know it because none of them, have actually sat down and watched an interview with what is a very intelligent and uh, very eloquent man when he's describing what's really going on in his region. I'm not saying that uh, these people that lead these countries like Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, before we go in, and, and still Syria as we're in there, are, you know, pillars of their community and the greatest things and haven't done uh, bad things to their people. But you show me one leader that hasn't. You look at our country, and you I think you'd be pretty hard-pressed to find another leader that signed off on as many deaths publicly as somebody like a George W. Bush or a Barack Obama, period. When we look at just the impact of our drone strikes alone, it far surpasses what we say all of these monsters do. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the good point there. I don't want to spend the whole show on the Middle East. But I definitely wanted to draw attention to some of the stuff that it isn't being talked about. Like you said, what was it called the OPC? What's the, what's the acronym again? The OPCW. You know, this is an organization that's supposed to be against the proliferation of what? Chemical, Chemical weapons. weapons. Yes. Yeah. And they basically shot down the whole idea that Assad, uh, basically it was a staged false flag. It never really happened. And now we have three different whistleblowers all saying the same thing. You have to remember that was the impetus for not just Obama originally, but Trump back in April also sent in a whole bunch of hellfire missiles and everything else. So you have this idea of this. And, and again, he's a dictator. He's no different than I'm, I'm sure Gaddafi was or, or, or any of these people. But most of the time they're propped up because they're doing the goodwill. They're doing what the, what the empire wants. They're doing what the American empire wants. They, they might be assholes, but they're also assholes who are selling fuel or, or giving, uh, giving access to the big uh, multinational corporations. Got a, got a question. So, sure. in other words, there wasn't any mustard gas? No. Assad did not use the gas no. on his people. No. So let's let's and let's break down what we're talking about when we're talking about these OPCW leaks really quickly. We're talking about the April 2018 attack that Trump um, said, you know, was horrific, it was savage, it's the one that Ivanka couldn't believe, and that's why we sent mess missiles in there. This is now over a year and a half ago. And if you go into the, it's not just three whistleblowers, these are just three document dumps of the vast majority of the people that worked for the OPCW and put together the initial report. The initial report was censored and never put out. It was never yeah. put out. And the first leak was a part of that initial report where they said that the canisters, they said, dumped this gas, even though people like Pearson Sharp, Robert Fisk, and others actually visited the region, region saw no evidence of a chemical attack, let alone a regular attack, and none of the people in that region said it had occurred. I mean, you have film. You can go watch it on YouTube right now, anybody that's doubting Jason Burmes. Then you type in WikiLeaks OPCW, and you can read the report that they said these things looked like they were placed there and had nothing to By do hand. with the chemical attack. By hand. By hand, exactly. And now, yes. in the third leak... We actually have questions arising to why these children were in that hospital on video. Now, remember, Russian officials, within a week of what happened, had one of the young men, and he had already been on video. He obviously was not the victim of a chemical attack. He described being drugged into the, into the hospital by men off the street with a video camera with water thrown on them, and all these kids were hysterical because they didn't know what was going on. They got their footage, and then they walked out and left. Nobody in the hospital said they treated anybody for a chemical attack. This is a I saw, total blackout I for a year part, and a half yeah, plus. Yeah, I saw part of that report, and, and the part that was, uh, this is what I always say. It's not necessarily what your mainstream media tells you. It's what they're not telling you. And if you look at that report, all the stuff that debunked 
the original or official story saying, again, these canisters didn't fall from an airplane and fall through a roof. They were placed there by hand. They were photographed. You could tell they didn't have any scarring on the sides of the canisters from having busted through a building. Right. They were hand placed there. And then later on you have this hysterical video that Jimmy Dore likes to play a lot of a so-called CNN reporter supposedly sniffing a backpack and going, oh, yeah, there's definitely something uh, tart. There. You know, in other words, Mick, if someone said there were chemical weapons used, would you walk up to the backpack and no, sniff it? Sniff it? No, no. <laughs> okay. no. So that's the actual CNN reporter going, oh, no, there's something oh, definitely he was wrong. Just doing his job, no, she, it's a she. <laughs> oh, it's a she. But okay. it, it just goes to show you that uh, when they're works. trying to sell you a story, it's so easy to poke holes in it because you say no person in their right mind would go up to something that is considered a possible chemical area and start sniffing things. With no gas mask. <laughs> but, and she's a CNN She reporter. was a CNN reporter, for well, sure. Why would they do that? Well, because they're trying to sell you the idea that Assad did gas his people so we could invade the country. It's about natural gas pipelines. It's about geopolitical uh, strategies. Again, it's about everything from uh, the Israeli uh, neighbor and everything that's going on in northern Syria and near Turkey. There's always more to the story than we learn. Jason, I want to spend uh, our entire segment on this. I have to ask you a little bit about Epstein. Uh, I know last time we talked there was supposed to be a big data dump or a bunch of documents. Has that happened? And is there any new, oh, yeah, uh, functioning or, I'm sorry, missing video? <laughs> I, I do know that. So why don't you pick up and fill in all the blanks for us? Yeah, so much to talk yeah. about. So it doesn't look like we're going to get those 10,000 pages, Ledge. Looks like those are going to remain censored. Um, that they are going to be kept away from the public. It's it's unbelievable. It's abhorrent. And it also looks like we're not going to get the documents uh, that would provide us a clearer look as to why he was able to cut such a sweetheart deal down in Palm Beach. Uh, both seem to be restricted as the public is uh, forgetting that they even existed in the first place. On January 16th, we'll have yet another hearing. Uh, so we'll see from there. But those 10,000 pages in the defamation case with uh, Ghislaine Maxwell um, is really, really troubling. Uh, the uh, Maxwell attorneys are claiming that these documents are not judicial documents. And since they are not judicial documents, they don't serve the public interest and they should not be made publicly available. Obviously, um, the opposing lawyers for Gifrey Roberts are saying another thing, uh, but it does not look good. People like Vicki Ward are tweeting about this. I'm keeping it covered. And now you fast forward to yesterday, which I really want people to pay attention to because we don't have video now of the first quote unquote suicide attempt. But what the media is ignoring is not only that Michael Baden says that he told his brother that the first time wasn't a suicide attempt, but Mark Epstein gave an interview to, I believe it was, uh, it was either the Palm Beach Post or the Miami Herald, where, again, he's defending his brother and he's obviously lying about the sex trafficking and the underage girls, but he says that his brother told him after that first suicide attempt, it wasn't a suicide attempt, that Nicholas Tartiglione, his cellmate, attacked him and tried to kill him. So you have to ask yourself, why was he put on suicide watch in the first place if that was the case? And if you look at the initial reports, it was very it unclear. Yeah. Very unclear. And the other thing is that Tartiglione is up for quadruple murder. He's an ex-dirty cop who got caught up in a coke deal, decided it was okay to kill four people, allegedly, and bury them on a farm. massive roided-out dude, Mick. He was just like, he looked like, he looked like the Hulk. I yeah. mean, can you imagine Epstein having that guy... Uh, what was it? Uh, oh God! They put him in there. What was it? What was the movie Why would they put him in that had Richard Pryor and uh, Stir Crazy? Oh, Stir Crazy! Yeah, remember Stir Crazy? Yeah, one of my favorites. Well, they had this big guy named Grossberger. Yeah, he was the biggest guy, and he had and he got stuck in the cell with him, and they, you know, he was he was known for you know beating the hell out of anybody and everybody. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Epstein had a big ass Grossberger in his uh, in his cell with him. His brother says my brother didn't try to kill himself. He got his ass kicked by that guy, and now, as of yesterday, the video of his suicide attempt is now missing. There was a video. Oh that, yeah, the first of uh, the first one, the July twenty fifth incident. So let's talk about oh. that for a second. Tortiglione, this came up in his hearing, um, is saying that he saved his life. This was going to prove he's a good guy, and maybe he shouldn't get the death penalty. And the lawyers admit on the surface it looks troubling. Really? Does it look troubling that we don't have camera footage of the first suicide attempt when it might not have been a suicide attempt at all? Does it look troubling that we don't have camera footage of the second uh, suicide that worked 
<laughs> and we don't have any guards. He wasn't found for over an hour. He literally had it happen less than uh, 24 hours after the 2,000 page dump and less than 24 hours after supposedly being taken off suicide watch and put into a cell in solitary for the first time. I mean, if you believe this stuff, please send me money to be king of the world because you might as well just waste your life away in fantasy land and imagination land to not understand the cover-up is in full force. It's over, man. The FBI cleanup know. crew is didn't in, they, dude. Didn't they uh, either arrest or charge the two guards? Oh, yeah. Uh, haven't they? Oh, yeah. Well, whatever came from that? It's going. They have to, So there's a male and a female guard, and they have their defenses, and they feel like they're going to be proven innocent. I, I suspect that they're working with whatever authorities they can to not get railroaded and uh, possibly end up suing the jail uh, system itself. Because this, this is going to be the end of it, Ledge. The jail system is broken, and that's why this happened. Bill Barr already told you, and Bill Barr's a great guy to all those MAGA heads that can't get their head wrapped around that this guy goes far beyond that left-right paradigm. This guy goes far beyond just presidents of the United States. And when you have somebody like Maria Farmer, who went to the NYPD and the FBI in 1995, and nothing was done. We're talking about something that happened 24 years ago, and we can barely put the pieces of the puzzle together. The cleanup crew is in. They are, they are trying to manage all this information. If those documents come out, I can guarantee you it will be months and months and months, if not years, of litigation before we see them when the public is less interested in this, this story, and that's what they're banking on. Yeah, yeah, they're, they are truly trying to get this to disappear from the news cycle. It, it's, it's dying out. The Epstein memes are kind of, no pun intended, uh, dying out on the, on the Internet. But well, I gotta, we've gotten our point across. Yeah, maybe. Uh, well, we'll keep the story going because it is uh, vitally important, and it is, as, as Jason likes to point out, it goes way, way back even to the mid-'90s, all kinds of political intrigue. Got to ask you a couple more things about this. I just saw that uh, you said that his ranch out west – had never been uh, um, raided by the FBI or quote unquote uh, inspected, and I heard that that piece of real estate is up for for sale now. Yeah, no, it's it's again. If you don't understand the fixes in, they never even raided that place, and now it's going to be on the market. You know, the only places that we've seen visibly raided, at least in the United States, because remember, um, you had that separate European investigation that their cleanup crew was in on. All right. So you had something in Paris, London, probably some other places. But the only places that we know got raided in this are what? His uh, his island and the New York mansion. We don't even really know if the, the Palm Beach residents after the fact in this latest arrest got raided because New Mexico didn't. Both of those were named in the indictment. And remember how many weeks it took for them to just to go down to the island. We had that drone footage from Rusty Shackelford within days of his arrest, and you could clearly see that computer equipment was no longer there by the time the FBI got there. So, you know, the whole thing has been one big running joke of the permanent state cleaning this up. Listen, there are good people in the police force. There are good people in the FBI. That's why we got this arrest in the first place. I truly believe that ledge. But when you get to the upper echelons, when you get to that deep state marketplace that uh, Jeffrey Epstein was heavily involved in, arms dealers, okay, royalty, presidents, heads of industry, modeling companies, artwork, the list goes on. It just doesn't matter anymore. These guys can and will cover up everything they can, just like a banana republic. Well, think about this, and this goes all the way back to watching, I, don't, I can't remember if it was one of your documentaries or anybody else, but I do remember there were two or three FBI uh, investigators, probably mid-level or mid-high level, prior, prior to 9-11 that were starting to get a lot of scatter and chatter, as they call it, about, and they were connecting the dots. I want to... Uh, who was the, uh, it was Colonel, it was, uh, you're, you're, you know you're what I'm ta talking about two separate things. So you're talking about uh, Able Danger with Colonel Able Anthony Danger. Schaefer, which is something completely separate from Robert Wright and the FBI whistleblowers like Barry Kermati, who knew yeah. how the money moved from these Saudi Arabians into the hands of the quote unquote terrorists. You have to remember, one of the uh, lead hijackers, Khalid Al Madar, is a confirmed person who lived with and rented from an FBI informant. He is a confirmed person that got on 
a plane, supposedly Flight 11, um, according to James Woods, just prior to the attacks with three other supposed hijackers. Uh, Nawaf Al-Hamzi was the other one that was named. The other two could not be verified, but they weren't even supposed to be on that plane. James Woods, a pilot and a stewardess, all filed reports they felt like they were doing a dry run or might hijack the plane. How in the world this if that happens prior. in August? This was, uh, what was this, August, July, prior to 9-11? August. It was so, co- so August, yeah. You're talking about a month and, before these attacks, and three separate people filed reports, nothing's done. The point I want to make, Jason, is at, at the top of it, the point I want to make is once these mid-level, like you said, there are good people in the FBI, there are good people working in lots of different of the three-letter uh, places. It's the high, it's the high ups who will bury it and say we're no longer going there. Uh, you're off the story. Uh, and I remember the testimony of these FBI guys after 9/11. During the 9/11, these guys were in tears. They were testifying in front of Congress in tears, talking about every single time they went to the higher ups. It got shot down. It got shelved. It said never mind. Go do something else or whatever. And this is the same thing that plays out in something like the Epstein case, where they might invade uh, or, like you said, go to his island, find some actual evidence, they turn it in, and then the higher-ups go, well, those videos are going to go into the furnace, yada, yada, yada. So uh, uh, when you get to the higher-ups in, in all of the, you know, NSA, CIA, FBI, those are the ones that are really the, doing the dirty deeds. Those are the, those Sounds are the, like an X file script. Oh, definitely. It's oh, yeah. Well, where do you think they get their scripts from? <laughs> yeah, or, uh, <laughs> hey, from I gotta, reality. Yeah. I got to ask you. You know, Jelaine Mac- Maxwell. Uh, obviously, she's alive. She's released a statement saying she's going to talk about it on her terms. How come they're not trying to arrest her? Isn't she? Isn't she like a co-contributor to this entire sex ring? How in the world have we made no arrests? Um, again, if you read that original indictment, there are three employees that are clearly working with the FBI. Okay, uh, we know that they call this an enterprise. We know that these enterprises uh, existed in all areas that he had homes. That's New Mexico. That's Palm Beach. That's the island. That's overseas. And none of these people have been arrested. The Metro reported now over, I think it was a month ago today, that there were a four arrests supposedly to be me- made by the FBI. Now, I haven't seen any arrests. Maybe there are some things going on behind the scenes, but you would think that Ghislaine Maxwell, Jean-Luc Brunel, and some of these other high-profile people that have now been named in these documents, and there seems to be irrefutable proof they were part of this network that is publicly available. You'd think they'd get arrested, Ledge. Can they get sued by the by the, all the women that have come forward and spoken out? Can they name them and then can you get warrants that way? Well, these lawsuits are happening. So, so what has to happen is, in order for them to sue, like um, Maxwell, um, basically, and Gufrey Roberts are in court because Maxwell said she's a liar. And Gaffrey Roberts said, I'm not a liar. I put this out publicly. I'm suing you for defamation. She's not suing for the actual crimes of being sexually molested and trafficked by this woman. That's the sad thing. So you kind of have to wait. You know, Dershowitz, the same thing with Gouffre Roberts. He kept saying, well, she would never say this in public about me. She's shielded herself in a courtroom. And as soon as she did go public and make everything um, as uh, available as it could be, what do you do? He sued her. So he did uh, act on her word. What did she do? She countersued him. And now that's a completely separate case. Now, in order for these things to, to uh, get into that arena, these woman, women would have to make claims about them. And then, on top of that, she would have to call them a liar. And then they could sue her for defamation for calling them a liar. Yeah, but you still have to have evidence. I mean, you have to have co- you know, co- a corroborating evidence. If you say, you know, Jelaine, uh, or however you say the damn chick's name, was... She was really the pimp for Epstein. <laughs> she went to the modeling agency. She went to the runaways. She went to the, the homeless girls and promised them this big, beautiful, wonderful lifestyle. And, and she is, in, in anybody else's book, she's just as much a predator, Mick, oh, yeah. than the mastermind behind it all. Well, this, this sounds like a smokescreen here. They're, they're just throwing it up so that to kind of you know, get us on another track. Sweep it under the table. Yeah. That's why I keep asking about, can't they keep it in the courts? Epstein's dead, so everything that was with him died in the courtrooms 
But if you have more people that are guilty of something, yeah. you could and bring I them on. and I think the powers that be are going to bring them to justice. Yeah, they're not going to do that, Jason. We got about five minutes left, and I I, I have to ask you about the free speech issues. Uh, you you've been battling on YouTube to not get censored or demonetized. I don't think a lot of people realize. I, I think most people are just on their Facebook or their Twitter, and they've never been banned or they've never been penalized or or sent us, you know, to to the naughty room for a month or something. And more people that push the envelope, independent producers like you, independent media people, are feeling more and more of a backlash. You did your 24, 26 videos in 24 hours. You were trying to make a statement. And in, in a couple of minutes, can you explain how the vice has tightened up? And, and it, it pretty much is since Trump came into office. I mean, it really was. I mean, the Internet didn't seem too too filtered or or too censored and up until the last couple of years so give our listeners a little bit of the background of of how it used to be and how it is now yeah unfortunately ledge you know i and you know i don't like playing on that trump train but all of my videos 100 percent, are demonetized out of the gate that means that they go up for manual review. Now that not only limits my income, but it limits the availability of these uh, videos that show up in your feed or a notification or a suggested video, uh, admittedly by Susan, uh, I think it's Woja Kukowski or something like that, um, by 80% sometimes, but a minimum of 60%. So that limits my growth, that limits my revenue. And, you know, I'm showing a, a video audience here that a lot of these do get Remonetized. Uh, in fact, even some of my stuff on Epstein, uh, a lot of my stuff on Assange. Now, don't get me wrong, uh, a lot of it does get uh, remained yellow as, uh, you know, some of these topics are just not family friendly. Here's the thing I've never had a video locked, and I have Fabled Enemies on this channel, I have Shade the Motion Picture, I have Invisible Empire, etc. Now, I did a video just before the uh, Terms of Service change on Louis Gomer, who was called uh, somebody that was spouting Russian propaganda by Jerry Nadler yesterday uh, during this whole impeachment fiasco. Now, once again, I've never had a video locked. Well, I did a video called Louis Says the Forbidden Name at the Impeachment Hearings. What will happen to this video? Because I noticed that at these hearings, the media that was reporting on it, 99% would not play the clip or mention the name that Louis Gormier in Congress at an impeachment hearing named. And I thought that this was absolutely ludicrous. This is next level Orwell when we're not allowed to play a clip of a person naming someone who's a, a supposed whistleblower. And by mm. no means is Erica Caramello Bar a, uh, a whistleblower. But I can't say the real name. Who knows? They might pull this. So, yeah. so basically, he said a bunch of different people, not lawyers, that he would like to question. That person was among them. I never mentioned the name. I played the clip in the background. I said, well, let's see what happens. And lo and behold, two days later, even though it was originally demonetized, Ledge, supposedly someone watched it. I don't believe anybody watches these manual review things. I think they run it through a separate algorithm or somebody watches it for five seconds. It gets monetized. So supposedly, this is okay for everybody's view, right? Well, after it gets monetized, it's locked as private. They told me the reason that I had misleading tags. I had no tags in the video. My description is not misleading. There, are, There's nothing here to mislead anybody. And of course, I've appealed it, and I've not heard back from YouTube. But hey, with their new terms of service, they never have to get back to me. They set their yeah. own policies. And the funny thing yeah. is, Ledge, I actually did a video where I appealed it live on air. That one, demonetized out of the gates but now re-monetized as well, where I expose YouTube for lying and really having no terms of service other than we will do what we want. Do you see in the future uh, that it just gets, you know, that you that the whole YouTube thing, and we got to wrap it up here, Jason, but do you see uh, that uh, eventually people are going to go to, you know, I don't know, Vimeo or whatever websites, uh, DTube and all these other uh, secondary places will eventually where most uh, what we'll call modern-day media or new media or alt media, do you think they're going to have to leave YouTube eventually, pretty much? 
Well, you know, I like BitChute as a platform. I think that they would be able to challenge YouTube a lot better um, if they had a live streaming platform. I'm hoping they're going to put that together. Uh, in that case, that would be my my number one resource. But, you know, there are a lot mm -hmm. of other alternatives out there. The bottom line is the harder they squeeze, eventually they squeeze too hard and something else will come along that people will go. I just want a completely decentralized Internet. You know, forget about well, just... Well, hey, the bottom line is the more, the tighter your grip, the more star systems will slip through your fingers, you know. Yeah. The, you know, Princess Leia said it right to Vader, and that's that's all that matters for me, bro. <laughs> yeah. You know. Hey, and Jason. Take that to the bank. We're running late, bro. Give me some info where people can find you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You can check me out at YouTube.com slash InfoWarrior. You can just type in Jason Burmas. That's at Jason Burmas on Twitter, B-E-R-M-A-S. And I need your fans to do one thing for me. Go to that Twitter retweet my pinned tweet on Conor McGregor and Dana White exposing him for what he did to that woman and how they're going to have this guy try to fight less than a month from today. I'm doing everything I can to not let that happen. Tickets go on sale tomorrow. I never want to see Conor McGregor fight again. All the evidence shows that he is a violent rapist, not just once, and the UFC knows it, and they're promoting the guy. Go retweet that. Send it to Dana White and everybody you know. Let people know the truth. Thank you, Ledge. Just did. Just did. It's, I'm on your page right now. Just did. Yeah, it's good to see uh, the man behind that whole fighting uh, industry uh, having a backbone regardless of his superstar and everything like that. We are so late, Jason. I will talk to you very soon, my friend. Uh, uh, we won't talk to you, uh, yeah, maybe after Christmas. Are you good to go the day after Christmas next Absolutely, week? and Merry Christmas to you and your listeners, my man. You got it. Merry Christmas.